What we will be doing this, mo this morning for us, this evening for you, is the placement of two implants. Now, without the use of the Bicon Ultra Short implants, we would have had to open a Caldwell lock window and do a sinus lift first, then six months or so later, come back and place two implants. However, with the ultra short implants, the six millimeter implants, we are able to enter this crest and open a window at the crest, not on the side, but right here, elevate the floor of the sinus, with it the sinus mucosa, place a graft and implants at the same time. The design of the flap and design of the window will have to obey uh, the actual anatomy and morphology of the soft tissues and of the bone. As you can see, the bone in the area of the first and second molars is a little bit thicker, and the bone immediately next to the um, implant is also thicker. So the window will have to be about three to four millimeters posterior or distal to this implant, and will end right about the area where uh, a tooth used to exist a, a few months back. The design of the flap I will show you. <coughs> Do you have any questions before we start? Uh, we understand, fully understand. Great, we fully understand everyone else. Very good. So I'll uh, get ready. The patient is anesthetized. I'll just scrub in and we will get started. The question now, uh, if you can hear me, is um, whether the little scar in the center of the crest is going to allow us to uh, bridge that gap or do we have to make the incision right through it? All right, now, um, before I go on too far, I just will open it up. Don't suction all the red stuff. I need it. And we're going to collect some of the patient's own blood to use in the graft. Okay. Because of the good anesthesia we've obtained, we don't have a lot of bleeding. But we will get enough to get us uh, Well moistened. I just draw very slowly. And for a volume of about one cc, all we need is about a third to half a cc. You know, um, volume of um, half a cc of uh, graft, we need only about a third uh, cc of blood or milliliter. And we're getting what we need very easily here. And we'll just now finish up the flap. I may need to do more releasing incisions, but we won't do that until we know where we are. Section here. As you all know, we need to keep our releasing incisions away from the surgical site and in an area that can be hidden, all right, and that can be uh, aesthetically acceptable, <clears throat> but at the same time gives us enough visibility. Good. Little tag is coming up. Okay. All right. Take our time. We need to 
have all full visibility here. And a combination of um, blunt and sharp dissection. It's very hot in here. Good, all good here. The window will be from about this to right here. The implants will be on both ends of the window. Good. So these sutures are placed temporarily called the retraction sutures. Some of them are just sutured to the adjacent soft tissues. Some of them are just dangled freely from an instrument. We'll show you in a minute. Okay. By doing this, we free up one hand and it expedites matters a little bit. We'll place one on the palate. So. So, uh, we'll then just dangle the needle holder to the other side, thereby creating sort of an open, uh, open one. Okay, good. Chin up a little bit more. Okay, now what I need to do is design our window. If you remember from the x-ray, or from the radiograph that is, we need to stay approximately three to five millimeters posterior or distal to the existing uh, implant. And we can go about a centimeter in total length then. So this is a five millimeter osteotome. So by going from the back of the implant, I can estimate where I can make my cut, and that will be right here. I'll go right on top of the crest. Okay, hold this now. Okay, I'll swap. Good. A little bit of tapping now. Okay, so the idea is to score the rectangle and then we'll go and score the other end of the rectangle, which is going to be right about here. And now we'll go ahead and just score the sides. The thickness of the bone is somewhere about three to five. So I'm not going all the way through, but I'm going to score it so when it breaks, it breaks exactly where I want it to. Thank you. Now the question always comes up, why don't we use uh, piezo surgery, for instance? Because I think uh, this preserves the bone a lot, a lot better. But it is a lot noisier, that's for sure. Patients, you know, our patients are great and they allow us to do this, but it's not a pleasant thing, suction. Not by any stretch of the imagination. 
So we again add. we'll go back to scoring. Yes. Rather add. What are you using, uh, right before? Oh, all right. I'll what show you, you in a minute. Uh, I'm sure for the uh, scoring, I'm using ridge split osteotomes. Okay, this is a five millimeter one. All right. Uh, and the for other, the, that, uh, for the other, it's the uh, sinus floor flat osteotome. This is a three millimeter one. We have a two and a half, three and a half, four, five, and six sizes. Okay, so it's kind of flat. It just pushes against it. I want to score it some more. Mm -hmm. I'm using a smaller uh, osteotome now because I want to go slightly deeper but not too deep and selectively cut where I need to go, okay? I can feel it starting to move, but it takes a lot of work and a lot of patience. Okay, I switched to a smaller uh, sinus floor osteotome. And these actually come in the Bicon kit. The one area that's not the, uh, giving in is the palatal cut. So I'll just reinforce it or... And that may be just from because of the palatal slope of the sinus cavity or sinus floor. Either way, it will eventually fracture. We just need to make sure that that is in a controlled manner. it moving already. Suction joint. Good. So we will continue. Now I went to 3.5 millimeter osteotome. Still. Okay, we're starting to mobilize it. If in a minute I will stop and give you a very good view of it. But that is really the floor transport technique in, a, in essence. Now, my osteotome is actually going into the crest. It's about four millimeters inside the crest, which is the thickness of the floor. But on the mesial and distal, it's a lot deeper than that. So we will keep mobilizing it until it's, and, until it's free of the friction of the sides. However, you still have to be very careful because as you're lifting it up, the uh, sinus uh, mucosal lining has to give. So as you see, I stopped to talk to you, but in essence, even if I weren't talking to you, I'd be stopping because we want to allow the sinus mucosa to kind of swell and lift itself up slowly. A key to this technique is to be patient. So as you can see, how the rectangle now has mobilized in, it's telescoped in. Okay, it's very nice, healthy bone. Okay, the one dif difference in this in this particular case is that the posterior, the distal implant is going to start in the uncut bone because it's thicker, and then we will use the uh, we will burst into the uh, uh, window because this bone here is too thick to lift. This bone is here is ideal, so we will start from this end, and we will finish right about there. Okay. So the idea is also that the sinus lining, the mucosa of the sinus, is not the uh, most uh, uh, tenacious kind of thing. It, it will start to tear up. Okay, so now we are finished with the uh, sinus uh, floor transport. We will go on to um, the uh, sinus lift. I need the sinus lift curettes. Oh, you can <coughs> go in. And just make sure that your sinus mucosa is intact. 
and that it's mobilized. The only thing I don't like is this corner, so I'll go after it with the smaller osteotome. Hold this. Thank you. Because <clears throat> that, that will be more selective as to the corner only. All right. So here we are. And I'll aim more to the distal. Okay, and you can hear it when it's no longer resisting you. You hear that there is no resonance. It's sort of a flatter. No. So now we'll go ahead and place our implants. So I am using the pilot burr at a very slow speed still. And we're going to go right here. Okay, and all I need to do is... Go in approximately six millimeters, which is the depth. So now I will go to hand reamers and do the whole osteotomy with hand reamers or with sight expanders. So the posterior one will start here. Okay. And since I already know, hold this please, Jenna. I already know that the uh, window has given me um, a significant uh, with, so I won't need to start with the reamers for the uh, mesial implant until I reach the size of three and a half or four. So I will continue with hand reamers. Okay, what I don't like here is the window wasn't as... Okay, I want the uh, osteotomy, because of the bone uh, thickness, etc., it's going more toward the palatal. So we will correct that by making a secondary osteotomy more mesial and buccal and joining the two. When you're not drilling at high speed, you can maneuver a lot of things to your advantage. Okay, good. And go back to the three. Alrighty. Mm -hmm. Well, I will do this one so that it bursts. There. Good, take that. Go to three and a half. The idea, I want that little bridge of bone to sort of be obliterated. Okay, clean that. Okay. And we go now to the anterior part, and that is wide enough. And we go to the four. And now we should be able to uh, get some friction on both. Chin up a little bit. Good. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. Good. We're now uh, approaching the 80%, okay? Mm -hmm. Good, and that's exactly what I want. That little bridge now will be removed so that we don't create any additional trauma. We'll put it in the graft. So that little bit that joined our window would have been too thick to cut all the way out here. So we'll have a combination. We will still have the... Um, Try not to shake like that, if you can help it. Okay. And what I will do now is use a, an excite expander in the posterior one to see where, where I am. And I will combine that with the hand reamer. Yeah, and I'm using the expander in a circular fashion. Okay, hold that. And this is basically just a blunt instrument. 
like that. And you can uh, use it by tapping it in as well. As you see now, the key to the technique is that the um, uh, sides of the sinus or the sides of the, cr uh, the alveolar crest are narrow enough so that they would exert friction and pressure on the palatal and buccal of the implants. And that way, although we don't have mesial and distal contact sometimes, and certainly no uh, dense and solid and immobile floor, we can still have primary stability of the implants. Open wider if you could. Thank you very much. That, uh, and I can still feel the floor of the sinus there. It's that deep. And this is also site expander at five millimeters. The goal is to go to six millimeter in the posterior Time, time, watch. Your, oh, your, his head. It's okay. All right, good. And so now the mesial implant is prepared. I'm going to go to five millimeter by six millimeter in the mesial or in the bicuspid. It's a little bit too tight for my liking, so I will um, use the hand reamer as well and loosen it a little bit. The posterior one we will go to six, and that will be also done with expanders and hand reamers. Now I'll shave maybe a fraction of a millimeter here, but enough to give me a little bit more freedom of movement. And the same here. We'll go to five... 0.5 millimeter hand reamer for the molar implant or well, the second molar implant are you okay I'm getting close to the 90 percent mark here okay I gotta see this here Chris bear with me buddy okay All right, so as you see now, the two osteotomies have merged. Don't no suction that's this is the bone. There's a little bit of bone that kind of got left behind. We'll don't waste anything with the Bicon system, as you know. And this is the final size for the second molar area. Turn slightly to the left. Good. And. Move the camera. Right? Okay, don't suction there. Don't suction there. Okay, we're almost there. Just a few more taps and then. I will uh, put the implants in. I'll take a 5x6 and a 6x5.7. I will also take the graft now. Mix all together the uh, plug we collected, the bone we collected, and synthograft fine, one half gram. We can churn the whole lot together. And instead of spending all kinds of time and money on PRP, we allow the coagulum to break in to the bone graft particles and by mixing them with significant force we're able to create a sort of a putty consistency okay so I will keep mixing it now we have to get to a good level now we'll use a metal syringe to carry the graft into the sinus 
And as you can see, we've used less than uh, a gram of graft, whereas a sinus lift, even of the smallest size, would have cost you at least two grams, if not three or four, of uh, graft material. In this day and age, every little bit helps. The technique is a little bit more challenging, but um, it will cut down on healing time for the patient. And I do tend to overfill it a little bit because this, this, this actually action right now is what is lifting the sinus floor. We've mobilized it before, we've pushed it up before, but this is really, let me have that. And we will imbibe some of the liquid and then we will go ahead and place our implants first, the anterior one. And this is a five by six millimeter, goes in. Right, and the front end of that mallet, please. Mm -hmm. Retract a little bit more, Janet. Turn slightly to the left. A little bit of tapping. Yeah, very good. Okay, I will stop shy of the full depth because I don't want to risk the implant floating into the sinus. Okay, for that, we take the uh, sinus uh, lift abutment which we will then carry, this is a little bit too big. You can carry it with a um, rongeur or other carrying device, or you can just use the suction, which holds it very nicely and neatly. And we will put that right this way. And the decision I have to make now is what's the best orientation for this oblong type of, a, of an abutment, and I think Having the longer side uh, oriented buccally, palatally will be better because of the way the bone architecture is. Now, take this, I will take the uh, inserting point which sits in a, a groove right at the center of the top of this abutment and will place it to the full depth. The sinus lift abutment then prevents the implant from freely floating into the sinus also will give it added stability by engaging the crestal bone and because of its design will make it exactly at two millimeter depth now we'll move to the distal implant the implant at the second molar and that will be a wider implant because we have the width and that will be a 6 by 5.7 millimeter implant. We will place that now as well. Using the inserter retriever, this one had even more depth. And the question is, do we even... Okay, perfect. Mallet, okay. This one will have enough friction of its own that I probably won't need the sinus lift abutment. And I put it to the full depth now, I think at least. Now let's double check it. As you can see, it is nicely placed. I will place it a little bit deeper. The two implants will be a little bit closer together and a little bit far from the mesial. Um, uh, healed the implant because of just the nature of the, the movement of bone, the nature of the uh, flap design and so on for protection of the sinus. There is not much uh, we, we want to really change about that. What we really need to, to, um, to do is make sure that they are placed at the proper depth because with the implant, with the Bicon implant design, that the two implants are close together is not a big deal and that they are far from the uh, front or neighboring implant also is not going to be a big deal. So in this case, I will just go ahead and place the uh, healing plug because there was enough thickness at the distal end to give us stability. And that way I will keep uh, enough bone over the implants to create a nice crest. And for that, I just cut the uh, black healing plug outside the mouth and I will just turn slightly to the left so 
Uh, here we go. And we'll go ahead and place it in there. And as you can see, it's pretty solid. Okay. So we took advantage of all of the anatomical changes. And finally, we'll just fill up the, uh, or backfill the osteotomy. And no more hammering. I'm sure you're happy to hear that. Okay. Okay. And I'll take a Q-tip. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. And we pack it all in. And I'll take the scissors now, Kim. And if you would open the uh, gut suture. Okay, good. All right, open that gut suture. And now we'll just release it, okay? Just have you take one final look, chin up a little bit for me, and to the left. Okay? I might try to seat this baby in a little bit more. No. That's good. Let's see how it's going to close over it. And take that. Good. Good. I just want to make sure this is still under no tension, because if it is, we'll have to, uh, okay, perfect, suction. Hmm. We have to release it some more, but we don't have to, because it looks pretty darn good. All righty. And we will continue the closure with a continuous horizontal mattress suture. All right, and then we will reinforce the releasing incision. Okay, I'm going to go to another retraction device here. Good. And okay. Great. Come out. Okay. Good. Continuous baseball type running suture because I don't need the eversion in this end because there's no abutment to cover. Okay, and that will give us good coverage. Go back deeper. Right. Good. Good. That's. I know you're tired, yeah. Uh, I can I can believe it. I can't blame you. It's a long morning, but it's only an hour. Still is a long morning. Seems like five, right? <laughs> okay, we'll we'll end the suture now. Okay. Don't be afraid of combining types of sutures that that will serve the patient and the incision best. In this case, we start with a horizontal mattress. We finish with a running suture. Either way, we have closure that is tension-free and complete. So what I want you to see is this right there. Okay? And that's it. Great. Turn to the left, and that's the releasing incision now sutured. Great. Okay. I'll take questions. The key is not so much the, the number of teeth as it is the, um, the thickness of the bone that you can actually fracture, that you can mobilize into the sinus or into the, the, the sinus void and the, the cavity of the sinus. Yes, you can. Um, it, will, it will cost you either the implant or the, the window opening. Um, the best way to prevent that is to, um, is to um, use the inserter retriever and that way, if you go in too deep, you retrieve it. 
or to put the abutment in, uh, the sinus lift abutment early on so that you don't go in too deep. If, however, you lose the implant in the sinus, this is the other indication for a lateral sinus lift window. You have to open a window, go after the, uh, the implant, bring it back, and then repair your sinus. So in this particular case, your best bet is to use the inserter retriever. If we were to do a lateral sinus lift, we would have had to let it heal for six months, then place the implant, and with a little bit of luck, we would be able to uncover it in five months, four months. So by doing the two procedures together, we've gained uh, the difference. And now, in about five to six months, the patient not only will have these implants integrated um, and ready to restore, but he will most likely have the restorations. Uh, not, unle not unless I have a defect in the um, uh, periosteum or if I have to graft on the outside of the bone. For the crestal uh, graft, as you saw right now, uh, we don't un really use a, uh, a membrane. In fact, the membrane is, is uh, detrimental because it will pre uh, slow down the healing of the incision as well and, the, uh, and, and it can cause breakdown of the incision. So I have not used the membrane for this technique yet. We do that routinely. We do uh, a, a thorough curettage of the area, remove all remnants of any soft tissues in the socket. Okay? If there is uh, purulence or any uh, type of active infection uh, in the socket or a missing uh, buccal bone, then we may graft first. However, that's a small minority of the cases. Most of the cases would have some uh, slight residual um, scar from a root canal treatment. For those, we will remove the tooth as atraumatically as possible. We will curette the socket um, forcefully and very thoroughly um, and irrigate it with, uh, no, uh, with um, water because you want the hypotonic solution to help destroy whatever living cells, especially bacteria, are in the area. Let it sit for a minute or two, suction it out, clean it, and then um, freshen the whole socket with the, um, with the implant reamers, and then put your implant. You don't need to seat the implant all the way to the full depth of it, but it is important that you freshen up. You remove all of the old bone out of that socket to create a favorable environment for healing. Um, I've used all of them, and the one that works best in our hands with the techniques that we are using nowadays is the synthograft. It mixes very well with blood. It has a very uh, good healing, excuse me, good uh, handling consistency. And it, it is replaced with the natural bone very quickly in as little as five months. And so that's, these are the reasons I like to use the synthograft. I just find that it, it, in my hands it works very well. Well, the, the Bicon design is for an intracrestal placement. The sloping shoulder of the implants are designed specifically to be within the crest. It doesn't affect the healing and the integration, but it will affect the aesthetics of the case. As you can um, look at the um, case, uh, actually the implant immediately to the mesial of the two that I've just placed, you will see that... Um, the uh, a part of it on the distal, the shoulder is not actually within the bone and it doesn't affect its longevity and integration. However, the only way to make it look aesthetic is with an integrated abutment crown. So if you don't want to use an integrated abutment crown, you want to use porcelain fused to metal crown, your best bet is to have the implant within the crest. It doesn't have to be deep in the crest. It just has to be about a millimeter, two millimeters, up to three millimeters within the crest and that will give you the best uh, or all of the options for restoration.